and it's still 2020 or is 2020 started yet? Um, anyway, it's good to have everybody online tonight. We're going to look at spirit beings. They're also called messengers or angels. And uh, since there are two spiritual kingdoms, gods and the adversaries, we need to understand how they are constructed and also how they parallel each other in order then to understand how they operate. Genesis 1.1, one, one, we've got to go that far back. In the beginning, God created the heavens. Explore out the first heaven and earth, except what God's word declares and from the geological records. Uh, we know that the original earth that God created in Genesis 1.1 1, 1 became desolate or uninhabitable. Uh, Isaiah 45.18 tells us this. For thus says the Lord, and it was made up, thus says the Lord, the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, and he created it not in vain, to no purpose. He formed it to be inhabited, and by the way, I am the Lord, and there is none else. So, and then Genesis 1-2, then the earth was, it's the Hebrew ha yah, which from the context means became. The earth became then without form and void, or like the New International Version says, formless and empty. This, this inhabitable earth became formless and empty, and darkness then was upon the face of the deep. So the original earth that God created in the beginning became overrun with water. Then God reformed, remade, and recreated it. The end result of this makeover is what Adam and Eve received. So 2 Peter chapter 3 from the Working Translation, uh, verses 5 through 7. So everybody's muted, I hope, because I'm hearing somebody eating pistachios or something. Um, so 2 Peter 3, 5 through 7. Certainly, this escapes their notice, and that's the world. It escapes their notice, that's for sure. So certainly, this escapes their notice as they choose. They choose to be dumb and stupid and not caring about God or what Jesus Christ accomplished. So certainly this does escape their, escape their notice as they, cho as they choose that the heavens existed a long time ago and the earth stood out of the water and in the middle of the water by the word of God. And by these waters, the world at that time was flooded with water and it was destroyed by water. However, so that was the first heaven and earth. We'll talk more. The reason all of it, we need all of this is we're going to go back to the beginning of uh, understanding who the angels are. And uh, it says the current heaven and earth. This is the heaven and earth that we're a part of. The same word, God spoke the first one into being, God spoke the remaking of it all into being, and this same, through the same word, and now this heaven and earth is laid up for fire, being preserved for the day, for the day of judgment, and for the destruction of ungodly people. And so we could applaud right now, but th that's why God will say, he'll take, he takes vengeance. We don't have time to deal with a lot of that. So there will be judgment and there will be destruction of ungodly people. And there's probably only what, three or four of them in the world today? Okay. This describes the overthrow of the first heaven and earth. This is not talking about the flood of Noah. The second started, the second heaven and earth started in Genesis 1-3, but a third one is coming in the future that will be similar to the original one. And we know by, because we're going to keep reading here in 2 Peter chapter 3, we'll pick it up in verse 10 with the working translation. Nevertheless, the day of the Lord will arrive as a thief, during which the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the physical elements will be destroyed with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works in it will be discovered or exposed. So since all these things are to be destroyed, how are, the, how are your collectibles these days? Because everything's going to be destroyed. Um, what kind of people should you be? What kind of person should you be now that everything's going to be destroyed in your holy manner of life and godliness? While, how are you to live your life uh, you know, how you live a godly life while you're looking for and eagerly expecting the coming of the day of God. And because of that day, the heavens being on fire will be destroyed. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, 
according to what he promised, we who understand this can look for new heavens and a new earth where justice dwells. So what happened between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2 that started the world toward destruction? Okay, that's a good question. During the time frame of the original creation, when God created the heavens and the earth, he created spirit beings, supernatural servants, referred to in the Bible as messengers or angels or even stars. God placed all these created spirit beings under three chiefs or archangels, under Lucifer, Gabriel, and Michael. Now, I want to clear up a couple of things. In the non-God-breathed apocrypha books of Tobit, I don't know how many of you have read Tobit, but there's a whole bunch of books that are accepted by the Roman Catholic faith. They're called apocrypha books. They're not God-breathed. They're pretty decent historically. Uh, if you want to have a little bit more history, you know, some of them are great, like Bell and the Dragon and uh, uh, Maccabees. Some of those are, are, you know, interesting historical books. But the book of Tobit, the angel Raphael is mentioned. Now, I know a lot of these, a lot of these names really sound like they're Ninja Turtles, but um, Raphael is mentioned there three times. In fact, in Tobit 12, 15, it says, I am Raphael, one of the seven holy angels. Well, the rest of the Bible doesn't say that, but if you have read chapter 20 of the book of Enoch, another non-God breathed book, I've got a book of Jasher, the book of Enoch, all these ones that are talked about that people just wrote things up about, made up great stories of Bible characters, and this is, you know, and then sold them, and people bought them. Okay, so in the book of Enoch, it mentions the seven holy angels who are called, you know, they're the watchers. And they're considered as seven archangels. And they're Michael, Raphael, Gabriel, Uriel, Serechiel, Requiel, and Remiel. Now, Uriel, though, Uriel is considered one of the archangels of post uh, after the exile of the rabbinical tradition. And he's also included in a lot of Christian traditions. Which are part, that make up not God breathed things like the apocryphal books, Kabbalistic, and occult works. So I want to worship somebody who's worshipped in the occult. No, we don't. But that's where Uriel comes from. Uh, is is very big in these different things. And and they get this from Revelation eight two about the seven angels. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So, so I guess uh, these seven archangels knew how to play music real well. They were all given seven trumpets. Now, since God did not give names to them in the Holy Scriptures, these seven names are derived from Judaic tradition and therefore are devoid of divine authority and meaning. So if somebody tells you that Raphael or Uriel visited them, uh, you might want to clarify uh, where they actually came from. The name Lucifer now, it occurs only once in the King James Version of the Bible, and it really means, it's really an adjective for the shining one or light bearer or light bringer. It's more an attribute than a name. God refers to him today as Satan, the devil, the dragon in Revelation 12, 9. But he was the one given the greatest responsibility. He was next to God in authority and power, and originally he was second in command. The only one above him was God, he was as high up as God could place any spirit and authority and power. So we go to Ezekiel 28 to see that. Uh, you know, when God went skiing, he'd leave Lucifer in charge, okay? He was next in charge. So, or maybe when God went golfing, which reminds me of a couple of jokes, but we don't have time for that. All right, Ezekiel 28, 14. Thou art the anointed. Now, the anointed means you know, he's anointed as the guardian cherub. So thou art the anointed cherub. You have been anointed as the guardian cherub. That was his purpose. He is the guardian cherub that covers. And I have set thee so. So God placed them there. That was his function. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire, or the flash stones or the lightning bolts. It's really fun to read the different translations on these verses. Thou was perfect in the ways from the day that thou was created. So God created them till iniquity was found in him. And you can't hide iniquity from God. Now, we'll get back to him later, but the second major ruling messenger archangel was Gabriel. 
Gabriel is God's special messenger carrier. When God needed the message delivered to someone on earth, he would send Gabriel, one of Gabriel's angels. Now I believe he does Twitter or email or uh, something like that. But back then he had to send angels. Now Gabriel is from the Hebrew word Gerber. So if you have a baby, you're probably used to feeding your child Gerber. So Gerber means man or mighty man. Gabriel, L means God. Gabriel is man or mighty man. So Gabriel means mighty man of God, or you know, he functions as God's special envoy or message carrier. So Luke one gives us some examples. <clears throat> and the angel answering and said unto him, Zacharias. And you know, if you've ever entertained angels, which we'll get to, but if you ever, you know, this is not a flunky angel. I mean, this is this angel said, I am Gabriel. Now you know something big's happening with when Gabriel shows up. So he tells Zacharias, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God. And I am sent by God to speak unto you, and I'm going to show you glad tidings. That's a much better thing from coming from an angel, glad tidings, than many other things that angels have delivered. Uh, verse 26, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, again, was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. When there is a message that needs to be delivered, God calls on Gabriel, or one of Gabriel's angels, to deliver the message. Now let's go to Daniel 8. We'll see some, something here. Daniel 8, 15. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, I had seen a vision, all right? Daniel sees a vision. Many times the word dreams, uh, that it's translated, written in King James as dreams, is really the word for vision. So I have seen the vision, and I wanted to know the meaning of the vision. So there beheld, there stood before me as the appearance of a Gerber. It looked like a man. The messenger had the appearance of a man. He didn't float in with his wings and flap them around, all right? No wings. He had the appearance of a man. Since spirit beings, now this is important, since spirit beings have no form or body, God can depict them any way he chooses. Lucifer is called the anointed cherub, or uh, one translation has it, you were anointed as a guardian cherub. In Ezekiel 28, 14. Now, cherub is a singular. Cherubim is plural. And they're depicted as having wings. They represent protection as guardians of their sanctuaries over the throne of God. And they're utilized utilize as a warning sign. So I have an autographed picture here by Gabriel. Now, what this is, is when Ron Wyatt saw the Ark of the Covenant, he described the angels, the anointed cher the cherubs that are picked as guardians, and it was overlaid in gold, and you can see the wings are touching. They're looking at each other. Sometimes they're depicted as angels kneeling with their wings reaching over. That's a terrible depiction. I don't know where they got that one. But the back wings touch, and they, the mercy seat where God resides is here in between them. But they're looking at each other. When I went to Ron's Museum there in Tennessee with Jack, uh, they had a blanket with this picture on it, and I'd never, ever seen a representation of a cherub the way Ron pointed out the cherub. Uh, it was different. And I asked his wife, Mary Nell, at the time, where did that come from? And she said, that's the description from the ark that Ron had seen. And so they're facing each other. They're touching. And they have uh, nice little turbans on, so to speak, their hats, and uh, all overlaid in gold. So this is a real interesting, uh, a, a very interesting depiction of what a cherub was that was over the Ark of the Covenant. So back in, in your handout, uh, in Genesis 3.14, cherubs, you know, uh, they were they put ninja cherubs at the end of the ed edge of the Garden of Eden to keep people from coming back into the garden. So they were there to protect. So the cherubs are guardian. Uh, are guardian, and they're depicted as having wings. And uh, they were there to protect the tree of life, because if they would have gone back in any of the tree of life, they would have never been, they would never been able to be redeemed. Uh, 
In Exodus 25, 18, they surround the mercy seat in the tabernacle, and that's what this picture is. They touch in the back the mercy seat, or the seat of atonement is where you know God rests on the mercy seat. Uh, so they're they're guarding that. And then also in 1 Kings 6, they are guardians of the oracle, the oracle being you know the holy of holies in the temple. Uh, and also in 2 Chronicles 3, it talks about them. They're on the veil in the temple. So when they built the veil in the temple and brought it down, they wove they wove cherubs on the outside of it as a warning that you better not come in here. Leaving if you go in. So uh, they faced out warning anybody not to come into the Holy of Holies. Now, seraphim, again, that's plural. This is another form of angelic beings that serve as the caretakers of God's throne, and they continuously shout praises. They are depicted as having three sets of wings, though. And this is, you know, uh, only one set of wings on cherubs, but three on seraphims. Isaiah 6 discusses these uh, creatures. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, and each one of them had six wings. Two of them covered his face, two of them covered his feet, and with the other two, they were free to have him use the fly. And one of them cried out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with hope. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwelt in the midst of a, a people who are really unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. So then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Great illustration uh, of an angelic being utilized to cleanse somebody so they could speak for God on God's behalf. Because Isaiah was a little reluctant to speak for God, as many people are at times. But let's go back and revisit the Archangel Gabriel back in Daniel 8. So we're in Daniel 8, 15. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen this vision, and I sought the meaning. Then behold, there stood before me the appearance of a Gerber. That There's four different Hebrew words for man. And each one is very unique and has a different meaning. So when you read man, a lot of times it's worth reading which man. And we'll, 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 we'll look at three of them. We'll look at Adam and Ish and Gerber. In fact, Adam is coming up here. And that deals with Adam or Adam. That's his name, man. So I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli. So a man's voice, and this man is Adam. This is not the Adam. But it's a descendant. It's man who is reckoned like Adam. Uh, and I heard this voice which said, "Gabriel, make this man to under make this man to understand the vision." So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid. I mean, this is Gabriel coming to me. I heard a voice, like a man's voice, and so I fell on my face. You know, but he said to me. Understand, O son of Adam, O son of Adam, for at the time of the end shall be this vision. So God gave Daniel a vision. He sought the understanding of it, and it would come to pass at the end, at the time of the end. Are we there yet? Well, we are, remember, in the parentheses, the mystery, and it talks about the next administration. So Daniel was afraid, but God had Gabriel explained the message so Daniel could understand it. 920 of Daniel. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. See, Daniel is standing in the gap for God's people with his prayer life. Many times the prophet of the time of the day and time had to make intercession for God's people who were not walking properly. So they had to stand in the gap for God's people. And that's what Daniel's doing here. There's a time uh, in another chapter where it says, I looked and there was no man standing in the gap for God's people. 
And that was not good. So let's continue in 21. Yet, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man, now this man is Ish. Remember when God, uh, man for Adam at the beginning was Ish, and then woman was Ishha. Same thing except woman Ishha. That was the Hebrew word. So this is Ish, and then Ishha was for the woman Eve. Even the man Gabriel, so he doesn't have wings. He, he's coming in a man form, Gabriel. And God said, uh, so while I was speaking in prayer, even the Ish Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, remember last chapter, being caused to fly swiftly, he touched me about the time of the evening oblation. He informed me, he talked with me and said, oh, Daniel. I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Daniel was given a vision, no clue. God sent Gabriel to give him the answer, and it took him a little while to finally get to it. But he part of the answer was, Daniel, you are greatly beloved. Now, in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, interpretation of tongues and prophecy, we are called greatly beloved many times. And we need to continue to remember. We don't need, you know, a seraphim to put something on our mouth so we can speak. We've got the gift of Holy Spirit, something greater, um, so that we know we are greatly beloved every time we speak in tongues. But God was answering Daniel's prayer. God sent Gabriel to help him to understand the vision. Now, the third ruling archangel is Michael. Mike L. L again means God, which is always interesting because you got Mike L, Gabriel, and Lusa Fur. So he's not anything with God. <laughs> but again, that was light bearer or light bringer. But Mike L means who was like God. Michael is the only one that's actually called an archangel in the Bible. Michael's major assignment is to stand for God's people and to fight with anyone or anything that attacks God's people. Daniel 12, 1. And at the time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time the people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. So Michael is called the great prince, who stands for and fights for God's people. When God needs something accomplished in the spiritual warfare department, it's Michael and his hosts. Daniel 10, 11. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved. Here's another archangel saying he was greatly beloved. Understand the words that I speak unto thee uh, and stand upright. For unto, the, unto thee am I now sent, and when he had spoken these words unto me, I stood up trembling. Okay. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. See, God sent Gabriel as an answer to Daniel's prayer, but it took a while for him to get there with the answer. Why? Because the prince, the ruling devil spirit of the kingdom of Persia, withstood me, withstood Gabriel, or maybe it was one of Gabriel's angels. But for 21 days, Gabriel wasn't free because of the spiritual fight that was going on in the spirit realm. Finally, Michael showed up, one of the chief princes, to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So the leading daimon in the area of Persia was doing things to keep Gabriel from visiting with Daniel with the answers. And then Michael got involved, and finally he was able to come. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Now, this illustrates spiritual warfare between the ruling devil spirit, the ruling daimon in Persia, and angels from the true God. In fact, it got so intense that God had to send Michael himself to get directly involved. Sometimes it takes a while to get an answer to prayer and it's because the answer is in the spiritual realm. Daniel 10, 20 and 21. Then said he, knowest thou wherefore I came unto thee? And now I'm going to return to fight with the prince of Persia. When I'm gone forth, the prince of Grecia shall come. 
that I will show thee that which is noted in the scriptures of truth, and there is none that holds with me in this thing but Michael, your prince. So he, he finally got away from the prince of Persia, got there, gave him the answer, and Michael was there, and he had to go back and rejoin Michael, but the head daimon of Greece, of Greece basically, is going to get involved and try and stuff th stop things from going on. So there's a lot of spiritual things going on behind the scenes. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. you got to understand that, and this is a great illustration. These are top angels fighting with top devil spirits, trying to keep information away from Daniel. All right, so... These two spirit beings, Gabriel and Michael, were working together for Daniel and for all of God's people's benefit. Look at Joshua 5, 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over, it, over against him, and his sword was drawn in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and said, Are you forced or are you against us? You, you work for the advers our adversaries? And his answer was, well, as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, what saith my Lord and his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, take your shoes off from your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did as the angel uh, commanded him. See, the captain of the Lord's host, Michael, was sent by God to assist Joshua militarily in taking the promised land. They had crossed over the Jordan River with a miracle. They had taken Jericho, you know, and so actually they're getting ready to, and uh, they needed spiritual help to do this, and God sent Michael and his angels to assist them. Kind of reminds me of the Elijah record where uh, the enemy from Samaria shows up, and the prophet goes, yeah, no big deal. And, of course, his assistant is freaking out. And he says, hey, God, show us here. And the entire field, the entire city round about was chariots of fire. Um, it was God showing him angelic representations of who was fighting for the prophet and for God's people. They were all there. He just said they would be with us. It's a lot more than be with the adversary in this situation. And so then he blinded. The Sumerians, uh, I mean, the people that came and took him to Samaria, and then he listened to God, and peace was a result of that whole time frame. Spiritually, a lot going on. You need to understand your spiritual weapons, what you can claim, what you can expect. Here's some great record here. Joshua can't do this on his own. He needs God's help, and God sends in Michael and his arch Michael and his angels, Michael the archangel, the warrior, and his angels to assist Joshua, because they were supposed to free the whole land. They are supposed to take the caliphate and take, take them all out of the way, basically. All the unbelievers that were in the land weren't supposed to be there. Okay? Now, Jude 9. On the other hand, Michael, the chief, or the archangel of the spirit messengers, when he was contending with the devil and arguing about the body of Moses. So God told Moses to walk off into the sun, into the sun, you know, uh, into the sunshine, you know, sunlight. The, I guess it was getting dark and all that to disappear, and that's what he did. But they started to fight over the body, and Moses and uh, was up against the devil, and they argued over the body of Moses. And he wasn't so daring as to impose a judgment of slander, but he said, "The Lord rebuked thee." Even as powerful as Michael is, he did not fight the devil without the power of God. We need the power of God to help us, assist us in life. All right. Revelation 12, 7. There was war in heaven. Michael and the spirit messengers waged war with the dragon. And the, as we learned that last week, the dragon is indicative of the adversary in spiritual warfare, the dragon, in, indicating spiritual warfare and his spirit messengers. And they waged war and did not prevail. And their place in heaven was no longer to be found. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent who's called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his spirit messengers were cast out with him. If we go back to uh, verse 4 of this chapter, it says his tail drew or dragged 
a third of the stars, which is, like I told you earlier, angels sometimes are called stars. A third of the stars or the angels of heaven were dragged or drug out with the great dragon when he lost this battle and he cast them to the earth. So after the war in heaven, Lucifer was cast out into the earth with one third of the angels in heaven. These became the fallen angels or devil spirits. How many are there? Well, we don't know exactly, but Revelation 5.11 tells us, And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, or 100 million, thousands of thousands. Hebrews 12.22, But ye have come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable, or a myriad, which is, it was a funny thing. I was trying to figure this out. Okay, what's what's myriad? And I looked it up in a dictionary, and it's defined as 10,000 times 10,000, just like it's translated in the other translations. So, what, you know, 100 million, company of angels. Daniel 7, 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000, or 100 million, stood before him. The judgment was set. And the books were open. Now, this is probably a figure of speech, but it references over 100 million good spirit beings. There's a lot of spirit beings. That's the point. What is their purpose today? Hebrews 1, 13 and 14. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering or attending spirits? Their purpose then, as attending or ministering spirits, was to minister. They are sent forth to minister. To who? They're going to minister for the sake of them who shall be heirs of salvation, or those who are going to inherit salvation. God's messengers, his angels, are ministering or attending, attending spirits that take care of those who will be heirs of salvation. Well, who will be heirs of salvation? The born-again ones. God has his angels ready to assist his children in the body of Christ. They are available to help now. When needed, they're available to help. You know, you ask for, for you know, God to protect your car, your job, your building, and God sends angels down, you know, to stand guard. You know, got their you know, long trench coat spiritually or something, and they're making sure nothing happens to it. Romans 8, 16 and 17. The Spirit itself bears witness with our own spirit that we are children of God. Since we're children, then we are heirs also. First of all, we are heirs of God. Secondly, we're joint heirs with Christ. So that if we do suffer together, we shall also be glorified together as heirs. So the angels are sent to minister to those who will be heirs of salvation. Romans 8 tells us we're the ones who are heirs of salvation. Let's consider some things about angels. The first occurrence of an angel being sent from God is in Genesis 16. So let's look at the context. Genesis 16, we start in verse 1. Now Sarai, um, Abram's wife, bare him no child, no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing, I pray thee, go in under my maid, it may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened on the voice of Sarai, and Sarai, Abraham's wife, took, or Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian. And after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife, so a second wife, he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. This is proof as to who had the problem physically wasn't Abram, all right? It was Sarai. And Sarai then said unto Abram, Oh no, what did I have done? My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despising her eyes. Now the Lord's going to judge between me and her. And Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleases thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain on the way to Shur. Background information. Okay. There, 
She was an Egyptian, right? She's trying to go back to, to her land. Sure means wilderness. However, at the border, before you can get into Egypt, they had what was called the Prince's Wall. They had a series of forts that were along there that would stop people as they tried to go in. She knew she couldn't get past that. She was the property of somebody else. She couldn't just walk into Egypt. So she stopped by this well at this time, trying to figure out what, what to do, what, what she could do next. All right, because remember when Abraham decided to go to Egypt with his, with you know, and his wife got taken, Sarah got taken. That's what happened. They stopped at the wall. They were going through immigration, had to show passports and things. And word got out: Hey, there's a foxy lady coming into town. Uh, the, you know, this is supposed to be. She's the sister of this guy. So let's stay. You know, the king might be interested. So they knew about that. She knew that she couldn't get back in Egypt. So she's by this fountain in the wilderness of water. And the angel shows up and said, what are you doing here? Where, where are you going to go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarah. Can you imagine that? Abram's wife, Sarah, mistreated her? And the angel of the Lord said unto her, here's what you need to do. Return to thy mistress, submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, here's your reward. I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for the multitude. Now, what type of people came out of her womb? Unbelievers. You almost hate to read a verse like this, but again, it shows God's mercy because it is a seed of Abraham, not the seed. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and you're going to bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath Heard thy affliction. Now, I don't know about you at your gender reveal parties, but here's the angel revealing what this child was going to be like. And this child is going to be a donkey, an ass of a man, a wild man. So the wild man is basically, uh, he's a, going to be a donkey. He's going to be an ass. So how about that for your gender re reveal party? You know, that baby you got inside of you, it's going to be a man and he's going to be an ass. Uh, his hand's going to be against every man, and every man's hand's going to be against him. And he shall dwell, not dwell in, that's a terrible translation. He shall dwell away from the presence of his brother. He's going to be such a pain in the ass, because he is an ass, that they don't even want him to live around them. So he ends up living someplace totally away from the family later on. So I don't know if Kelly, you know, Aaron Jr., was foretold that he was going to be that what you guys would do. But uh, here's your gender reveal. You got an ass in there. This is the first recorded time of an angel from God being sent to help. The first time a spirit being got involved, though, in the affairs of mankind on earth was in the Garden of Eden, when the evil one possessed the serpent in order to deceive Eve. Now, let's move to Genesis 28. But here, there was a need. God sent an angel to help in the situation. So it was probably, it was information, probably one of Gabriel's angels. Genesis 28, 12. Jacob dreamed, and behold, a ladder. Not, not the ladder we think of, but like a ramp, big ramp, okay? A ramp set up on the earth. And the top of that ramp, you're going up the ramp, it's into the heavens. And he sees angels of God ascending and descending, walking up and down the ramp. Uh, in John 1 51, Jesus' first encounter with Nathaniel, he states a similar truth. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter you're going to see heaven open, and the angels of God are going to be ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The angels from heaven were receiving their assignments from God and were going to and coming from heaven to earth, performing them. So I think somewhere in Marvel Comics, Thor found this out, uh, you know, this little gate. No. All right, Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, ye his angels. Bless the Lord, ye angels that excel in strength. Bless the Lord, you angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments. He's not blessing the fallen angels, the angels that do God's commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. So this is a great illustration. I don't think you really can find a little portal into heaven where angels are coming and going. Okay, Hollywood probably has a lot of them. But it's a great figure for mankind to go, oh, look, there they go, back and forth. And here, angels that do his commandments. 
We know that some of the angels follow Lucifer in his rebellion. They are referred to as evil spirits, devil spirits, fallen angels, or they're also called evil angels or demons. Psalm 78, 49. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, indignation, and trouble. How? By sending evil angels among them. So evil angels among the people because God's people weren't keeping them out by walking for the true God, worshiping the true God. They got involved in worshiping other gods and anger, wrath, indignation, trouble followed and evil angels came in to cause problems. All right. Uh, look at 2 Corinthians 12, 7, working translation, talking about Paul. Furthermore, <clears throat> so that I would not be overly exalted by the reason of the exceeding greatness of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, um, to buffet me so that I would not be overly exalted. See, there are fallen angels sent by Satan to disrupt Paul's, and also, they're sent by Satan to disrupt our lives by stirring people up against us or by trying to introduce wrong doctrine. Here's an illustration of Galatians 1.8, wrong doctrine. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let them be accursed. You know, Don't let anyone, even if they appear as an angel of light, talk to you, talk you out of the truth of God's word. Paul and them presented God's word, the truth of it, the accuracy of it. And I don't care if an angel, somebody looks like an angel, shows up and contradicts what we said, don't believe them. Okay? 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15. In fact, such people are false apostles. They're deceitful workers. They're transforming themselves into apostles of Christ in appearance. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into a messenger of light. Therefore, it's no great thing that his ministers also transform themselves to look like ministers of justice, whose end will be according to their works. You lock in to the doctrine of God's word and you don't move off of it. Now, this is addressing people who have been deceived by the former angel of light and by his minions. Go to Matthew 4.11. Jesus Christ and the devil, the tempter had gone, uh, he, Jesus had gone through temptations. Matthew 4.11 says, then the devil leaves him and behold, God sends angels. Angels came and they ministered unto Jesus. Sometimes we need spiritual help. God sent messengers, angels, to come and minister unto Jesus. Well, if he needed help, do we need help sometimes? Yes. God sent angels to minister to Jesus Christ after he was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. He sent angels to minister to him in the garden before he's going to be arrested and sentenced to death. We read about that in Luke 22, 39, where we start. And he came out and went, and as he went, he came to the Mount of Olives. His disciples followed him. When he was at the place, he said, pray specifically that you enter not into temptation. So he withdrew from them a stone's cast, and he knelt down, and he prayed. And his prayer went like this. Father, if you be willing... Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, purpose to minister to him, to strengthen him, to help him, because he was in agony. He prays more earnestly. His sweat was of those great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping. Why were they sleeping? For sorrow. The apostles were sleeping because of sorrow. They mentally and physically could not handle the pressure, so they just checked out. They just fell asleep. That's how some people deal with pressure. It's just too much, boom, they're out. Well, that's what the apostles did. It wasn't because they had too much wine to last supper or because they were too tired. The sorrow, the intensity of the situation. Hey, he just told you he's going to die, and he's over there, and he's sweating drops of blood. What would you do knowing you know, what was about to happen? or them perceiving parts of it. They just fell asleep for sorrow. Luke 20, 34. Jesus answered and said unto them, You know, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, they don't marry nor are, in, are given in marriage. Neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels. 
They're just like the angels and our children of God being the children of the resurrection. See, the saints are like the angels in this regard, but they are servants and we are sons. In fact, we are going to judge angels. 1 Corinthians 6, 3, don't you know that you're going to judge angels? Now, you know, I don't know if this is the good angels, but we're definitely going to be a part of judging the fallen angels. They're going to be judged in the last time. So people are not going to be married, given in marriage and all of that for all eternity because there'll be no need for children. In Genesis 128, God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. He does not tell the angels to do this. Revelation 19.10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Here's what you need to do. Worship God. For the witness of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Don't worship the angel. Don't worship anybody else. The only one we worship is God. Revelation 22, 8, 9, working translation. And I, John, am he who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the spirit messenger showed me these things. And he said to me, don't do that. See that you do it not. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brothers, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of the scroll. Worship God. The angel specifically, worship God only. Do not worship angels. Unfortunately, many people today are worshiping angels. Colossians 2.18 specifically addresses us in this administration. Let no man beguile you. Let no man rob you of your reward in a voluntary or self-prescribed humility and worshiping of angels. You will lose your reward if you're not worshiping God, if you're worshiping angels. You know, intruding into those things which he hath, omit the word not, intruding in those things which he hath seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Or for no reason, he's all puffed up. Well, don't worship angels. Angels are in direct subjection to the resurrected Christ now. They weren't before he accomplished his mission. First Peter 3.22 says, Who has gone into heaven, is on the right hand of God, Angels are all messengers and authorities, exousia, powers, dunamis, being now made subject unto him. Okay, look at Matthew 26, 53. Don't think, thinkest thou, that I cannot pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. He had to ask his Father for the spiritual help in the form of angels before he accomplished salvation. But once he accomplished salvation, they are now under his control. Uh, Hebrews 13, 2 tells us, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. You know, we know the records in Genesis 18 and 19 of Abraham and Lot. They're entertaining angels. They don't, you know, they didn't flutter in their wings or hide them under the cloak or something. They just walked in as people, looking like people. See, God's spirit messengers were extremely active and useful in the first century church. So why shouldn't it be useful and active in the 21st century church? Acts 5, 19 and 20. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand, speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. So how did they become jailbreakers? An angel of the Lord opened the prison door. Acts 8.26, then a messenger of the Lord spoke to Philip and said, Arise. And I like the translation here uh, because it's, it's clearer. A messenger of the Lord spoke unto Philip and said, Arise, go at noon on the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, the same, ro same roads in the wilderness. So go leave at noon. That's the time frame you need to go to meet this guy. Acts 12. Now about this time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex the certain of the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Because it saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he took Peter, put him in prison, delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers. So 16 soldiers, groups of four. They were to keep him, they were to guard him, intending that after, I don't know how Easter got in there, intending after Pentecost, 
to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was securely guarded in prison, and prayer was made without ceasing or earnestly of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. And the guards before the their guards before the day, the door, they kept the prison. And behold, how do you break out of something like that? The angel of the Lord came upon him. Light shined in the prison, in the cell, and smacked him on the side. Woke him up, said, get up, arise up quickly. And just the chains fell off his hands. And then the angel said to him, get dressed, put on your sandals. So he did. And he said, <coughs> grab your cloak. We're getting out of here. Follow me. And he went out and followed him. Didn't know if it was really true, what was being done by the angel. He just thought maybe he was dreaming this. He was seeing a vision, right? Wow, this would be really cool if this was really happening. When they were past the first and the second guards, then they came to the iron gate that led to the city, and it just opened up of its own accord. And they went out, passed on through the street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he kind of shook his head. Whoa, this is really happening. It's chilly out here. <clears throat> now I know of a surety. Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered her. He has rescued me out from the hand of Herod, from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Now, these records illustrate the interaction of angels and the children of God. Now, <clears throat> hang on a second. I need that before I get into the serious. Don't you want to be involved in a movement of God that affects the outcome of the spiritual war? Good versus evil? Angels, devil spirits, right? Right understanding of ancient scrolls. Prophesies being prophecies being fulfilled, spiritual warfare, signs, miracles, wonders. Man, being a Christian and really standing for God is so boring. All these things are happening when you sell out to God and be a part of it. Well, we're a part of all of this. All right, Acts 27 20. When neither sun nor stars in many days appear, you know, uh, you talk about not being able to see anything for a long time. Nothing was visible in the sky and no small tempest, no small winter store pre storm pressed on us. You know, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. All they had left was a prayer. Everybody, it was sad. All right. So what happened? But after long abstinence, Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have listened to me and not left Crete. To have gained this harm and this injury or this injury and damage. But now I exhort you, be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you. We're going to lose the ship, but we're not going to lose any people. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. The messengers referred to in the scriptures were either spirit messengers, angels, or human messengers who are sent by God, sent by Satan, or by people. This context indicates which kind of messenger is being referred to. It's an angel of God. And they said, told Peter, fear not, Paul, because you're going to be, you're, you have to stand before Caesar. And lo, God has given thee all them that sail, sail with thee. And the Greek text adds, as a favor to you. As a favor to you, God's going to keep everybody alive. Wherefore, sirs, all you guys here, because of me, be a good cheer. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit, we're gonna be we're gonna be cast or we're gonna drift upon a certain island. When God originally created the heavens and the earth in Genesis one one, He created spirit. After Lucifer's rebellion, a vacancy in the number two spot developed. Most people are aware of Adam's fall, but they rarely consider or acknowledge the fall of Lucifer. God suffered two great major losses. He lost his right-hand spirit in Lucifer, and then his original man, 
who was made, formed, and created as a perfect man in a perfect world. Ezekiel 28, 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus says the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom, or you were a model of perfection, perfect in beauty. Now, the king of Tyrus was a false prophet. He was a prophet of Lucifer. And this is a figure of speech where you use someone's name, but you're referring, but what you are referring, what but you are referring what is being said to somebody else. This figure is employed here referring to Lucifer, because verse 13 says, Thou hast been in Eden. I do not think the king of Tyrus had been in Eden. <clears throat> so he's addressing the king of Tyrus, but he's really addressing in reality, reality Lucifer, who had been in Eden. The contrast of verses 11 to 19, where it refers to the king of Tyrus, compared to verses 1 through 10, where it refers to the prince of Tyrus, illustrates the physical, spiritual arrangement of many nations and their leadership. While the man in this case, the prince of Tyrus, ran the country physically, he did so with the permission of the king of Tyrus, who was the devil. The devil put him in there. The devil kept him going. The devil took care of him. The prince reigned over the country, but the devil had strong influence over him and his Thou has been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was the covering, all of these precious stones, the workmen of thy tablets and of thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. The stones symbolizes Lucifer's lofty or worthy position as well as his beauty. Verse 14, you are the anointed cherub that covers, and what would he cover? The throne of God. That's what the seraphims, the, you know, the cherubs, they covered the throne of God, right? You remember the picture? And I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. You walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in thy ways from the day that thou was created until wrongdoing or iniquity was found in thee. Now, the Hebrew word for iniquity is evil, whose root meaning is to deviate from a right standard, to act contrary to what is right. He was a cherub whose demise was due to his willful pride. Let's uh, continue in verse 16, but from the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, from the, from the Jewish translation. By your far-flung commerce, you were filled with lawlessness, and you sinned. So I have struck you down from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you. O shielding, O covering, O guardian cherub from among the stones of the fire. You grew haughty over time. You grew haughty because of your beauty. You debased your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I have cast you to the ground. I have made you an object for kings to stare at. By the greatness of your guilt, through the dishonesty of your trading, you desecrated your sanctuaries. You're supposed to guard them. You're supposed to cover them for the true God. And instead, you desecrated your purpose for being. So I made a fire issue from you, and it has consumed you, it's devoured you. I have reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who be you. Forward to seeing that in reality. All who knew you among the people are appalled at your doom. You have become a horror and have ceased to be forever. Lucifer literally, literally had it all, just like Adam did later. However, his haughty desire to be like the Most High God led, led him to not offer praise and worship along with the other cherubim and angels. His pride drove him to seek not only a better position above all of the angels, but a throne that would be loftier than the Most High God, who really is worthy of all praise and worship. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? As stated earlier, Lucifer is a Latin term, meaning light bringer or light bearer or the shining one. He is now cut down to the ground. He is no longer Lucifer. He is now Satan, the devil, the old serpent, the dragon, the evil one. Verse 13, 
for thou hast said in thine heart, in the innermost part of thy being, you grew in iniquity, and you said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the, the God star. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Notice the I will, I will, I will. Spirits have a will. They're not robots. They have a will. It sounds like this spirit, though, had an ego problem. An ego can really confuse someone. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, hell to shield. You'll be brought down to the state of death, to the sides of the pit. That's the sides of the abyss, actually. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a desert of wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of the prisoners? So between Genesis 1, 1, and 2. This is why the earth became without form and void. Lucifer rebelled against the one true God. A war ensued, which ended with him and his fallen angels being exiled from the heavens. The result to the earth was catastrophic, making it uninhabitable. Thus God had to restore the earth to make it ready for the first people. When Lucifer fell, the position of light bearer became vacant, and it was not filled until Jesus Christ. Christ earned it back today. Jesus Christ is the shining morning star. Jesus Christ today is next to God in authority and power. Revelation 22, 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you. These things by the churches, by the seven assemblies. I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the bright and morning star. Or the translation from the Greek is, I am the shining morning star. There was a vacancy next to God which Jesus Christ re was rewarded with because of a sinless life. He is now the shining morning star. Jesus Christ is the redeemer, and by his obedient walk, he redeemed what Lucifer and Adam had lost. God had suffered two great losses in Lucifer and Adam. However, due to the obedient life and death of Jesus Christ, both losses were rectified. Jesus Christ earned his position with interest, and second encounter was the devil, the evil one, the enemy of all justness, set himself up as the ruler of a counterfeit kingdom with many fallen evil angels loyal to him to help fulfill his aims. However, his end has been foretold and his kingdom will be totally destroyed. Revelation 27, 27 through 10, working translation. When a thousand years have ended, Satan will be released from his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, in order to gather them together for war. Their number is as the sand of the sea, and they went up over the extent of the earth, surrounded the camp of the holy sanctified ones in the beloved city. Things looked bad. However, fire came down out of heaven, and the fire devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophets are, and they will be tormented day and night. I love a happy ending. So that's what we get to look forward to because we'll be there watching it and just you know being a part, something doing something, but God will take care of all of that. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your love, your guidance, your greatness. How much care for us and for being you know, spirit beings are there to help us. Uh, but we're your children. We're grateful for everything you've done for us and how we can live for you today uh, through the power of Christ accomplished for us and is in us. Through the name, the powerful, ever never changing greatness of Jesus Christ. Amen.